Max Conner. There was a song once that said, what if Jesus comes back back in? I thought, how ignorant can the world be now? But when God comes back, he's not coming back as a baker or a pauper or a drug addict. He's coming back as king of kings, Lord of Lord. Amen. He's coming back to take us home. If you're saved tonight, when he comes back, you have a blessed hope. We're going to try to sing when he comes a place of rest, a perfect peace and happy reunion, eaten by the source of uncreated life. Amen. Amen. Yes, thank God. <clears throat> Would be today. Yes. Amen. Everybody good with that? Amen. Good big day. Listen, you don't have to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, don't have to set alarm clock and get up. You don't have to face all the trials and tribulations of the world. When he comes, we will... In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, yeah. someone said that's about one two hundredth of a second, and that eye twinkles, and you'll be home. Man, thank God. He bet. All right, yeah. Doctor W. Max Alden. Hey, man, everybody know what W is, right? <laughs> that's Watson. All right, you come on up here, Mister Watson. Hey, man. Hey, man. <laughs> All right.
Amen. I raise him a little bit. I like it when they go <laughs> use that. Uh, James uh, yeah. uh, Earl Green, he's always he's always just put some middle initial. He don't want you to know his name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, um, <clears throat> at W, um, for a while, I wouldn't even use it because they said, I thought that's supposed to be a last name. And I would have to tell them it is a last name. It was my mother's last name. And uh, as a young boy, when I was called that, and they would ridicule me by reminding me that that's not supposed to be a first name, but it's a last name. And then one day, I heard someone say, Honor thy father and thy mother. <laughs> and that's when I guess I added W to the, uh, to the front of it. I was kind of tiptoeing into the water. <laughs> But now, okay, almost uh, when you're going out in official places, you, they want to know your first name. Like doctors, <laughs> they want to know what your first name is. And, and now I have no problem saying my name's Watson, Alderman. My mother was a Watson. That was her last name. And that's what she wanted to call me and probably would have if it wasn't for my Aunt Maud. <laughs> my Aunt Maud didn't want me to, I mean, didn't want me to be called Watson. And I think it was, uh, when must have got out that she was talking about my name because one of my other kin folks named his Mule Mold. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you have to be careful about names, I guess. But I thank God uh, that I have the opportunity to honor my parents, even though they've been deceased, they've been dead and gone for a lot of years, but I have good memories and hardly a week goes by, if that long, that I'm not reminded some way of them. And uh, just like the preacher today was talking about the strength of his father, and how his father was a hard worker, and he was, had the strength to do what a man ought to do. We're living in a day now where you, people don't want to refer themselves uh, to themselves as being manly. It's almost like it's a curse come upon you if you're even a man, and in some cases, they're even emphasizing you being a white male. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong in being a white male or a black male or an Indian, uh, however God made you. Uh, that, we were talking about the junk today. That's some of the junk we ought to chunk. Uh, amen? <laughs> A lot of that stuff's going on just not by people like us. It's someone that's trying to stir up people like us. If you examine it and look at it, uh, most of the people they're talking about that's doing so many of these things uh, that would you would not even think about doing, but they're blaming it on you. Uh, they're just simply trying to keep things stirred up because Satan is the author of confusion. And if you hadn't figured that out yet, just read the book. <laughs> It tells you just like it is. In the last days, perilous times are coming. And as one old preacher would say when he'd read that, he said, honey, we have arrived. <laughs> and so I believe that to be true also. I want to invite your attention back to our text. And I thank you so much for letting me come back with you. I've been coming now for a number of years, probably uh, close to 15 years. And a lot of time passes during that uh, Time period. I think your preacher started using me at the very beginning. I appreciate it so much, brother. And uh, I appreciate so much being with you folks today. I see familiar faces. And one day on the other side, we'll all be joined back together. And all the tears and the sorrows on this side will be past. I, I, I like what the old black preacher said. Uh, he said his favorite verses in the Bible is it. And it came to pass. He said, I sure is glad it's not here to stay. <laughs> Amen. And I feel that way likewise. I'm, I'm thank, glad that some of the things passes on by him. As the preacher mentioned, my wife and I both have had some issues. We've been so blessed through the years. But uh, she spent eight months, I think, the last time that I was with you. I believe it was during that last time that I was with you or, or one of the times. My wife was not able to come because she was staying with her mother for eight months. She stayed with her mother until her death, and her mother was completely and totally bedridden. And uh, she had to do a lot of things because of 
that. Her mother was a, a large framed lady and it took a lot of effort and strength on her part. And she faithfully did it without complaining, for which I'm thankful. That's one of the ways she honored her mother. But almost immediately afterwards, uh, she had a meniscus tear and a baker cyst in her left leg. And uh, so she had to have surgery for that. And almost immediately after having that surgery, almost immediately, I guess she was leaning or giving way then to the, to the right side. She had to have uh, just about eight or nine weeks ago now, I guess, I've lost track, she had to have hip surgery, <laughs> total hip replacement. But uh, she's doing so good. Like the preacher said, she had hers done uh, two weeks before I had my surgery. And I, I told her, well, you ought to be well by then. <laughs> and, uh, and she wasn't exactly well, but she pitched in there and did as much as she could when I was going through my uh, I had a sigmoid colon removed. That's the lower large into, uh, part of your colon. And uh, I had that removed because I've been ba battling for probably a couple of years, even the last time I was here, I was battle battling diverticulitis. And, uh, and I did not realize how much relief I would get by having this surgery. Or I probably would have begged the doctor to have done it even much sooner. So um, I'm grateful that we've both been able to have these issues and take these issues taken care of and uh, in everything give thanks. <laughs> I'm thankful that I'm not still struggling with that diverticulitis and she's not still a female, um, I started to say Festus, but what's the other one? On gun smoke? Huh? Chester, Chester. She's not a female Chester now. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? The one that limped, uh, she was limping there for a while, but she did it with much grace. But I want to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Aren't you glad we have this old King James Bible? Aren't you glad we have church? Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And if Christ loved the church, we ought to both love and like the church. I sometimes joke people, or kid with people, and and I'm certainly joking and kidding when I say that. She said, uh, they'll say, do you really love that woman you got? I said, oh, I love her. I love her to pieces. I just don't like her. <laughs> and that's not the truth. But I have had people in the faith I've tried to love, but I sure have found difficulty just liking them. I went to Bible school with some people like that. I had to ask God to give me much grace because I knew that was one of the evidences uh, that's spoken of by Peter when it says, add to your faith, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and the virtue knowledge, and the knowledge temperance, and temperance patience, and patience brotherly kindness, <laughs> and to that charity. And uh, I realized when I read that scripture, I better start trying to love that person that's not too lovable, and to do good to them that despitefully use you, and even bless them that curse you, not bless what they're doing, but be a blessing to them in some capacity because the goodness of God even leadeth us to repentance. Aren't you glad of that? I'm studying right now in my study on Philippians, or Colossians rather. I'm studying, even this afternoon, I was working on my Colossians book. And uh, since uh, I was with you last time, the Lord put it on my heart. It all began in Russell Rice's class when he challenged our, the Bible students that we ought to have uh, writers. He said we ought not to go to the new evangelicals and, and the liberals and the modernists to get our theology. First of all, we ought to go to the book. <laughs> and then if we <coughs> read anything else, and that's okay too because Spurgeon said May thinks it rather strange that someone thinks so much of what he has to say and so little of what someone else has to say. And Paul himself uh, even spoke of having the books, but he always emphasized, but especially the parchments. And so just as we will come and hear a prepared sermon, just like in Sunday school this morning, preacher, not to flatter you at all, but the Bible says, give honor to whom honor is due. That spoke to my heart, the way you just looked at every verse in uh, Leviticus and how you're studying in Numbers and Deuteronomy, I guess, 
You go into Deuteronomy on down the line, I guess you're taking it in successions. And I think that's so wonderful how he's taking the Word of God line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept, precept upon here, precept, and then here a little, there a little. Why is that? Because no prophecy or scripture is a private interpretation. You compare scripture with scripture. Isn't that the truth? And that's to, that'll protect you against heresy. That'll protect you from uh, t interpreting truth in an improper manner. So I thoroughly enjoyed that. I'm enjoying opening up the Word of God with you today. And in this study I'm doing, I'm working now. I've just finished this week coming. I'll probably send to the publisher. I already have the book cover uh, prepared. But I've had the final proofing done by, you know, Brother Stacy Shiflett. His daughter is a missionary to the Philippines, like our brother today, along with her husband. And she is doing the final, has done the final proofing on my book on Philippians. And, uh, and so I'm sending it to the publisher probably this week. I want to look at it thoroughly before I do. And then I'm working right now. I'm almost a fourth of the way through the book of Colossians. And I tell you this because I'm one of your missionaries and I want you to know one of the things I'm doing in addition to my preaching around every given moment that I have free time, uh, I try to give time to the writing uh, of these studies and different books. I'm working in Colossians now. When I get through with Colossians, I plan immediately within a, a just a, peer, a week or so or two or three, not very many, I'm going into Ephesians and take care of Ephesians. And we and then I, after Ephesians, I'm thinking about either going into uh, the pastoral epistles, I have them already outlined, or may even go into uh, Peter, the epistles of Peter, such wonderful teachings and all. So pray as we do, and um, I've, I've committed myself to do this as long as I live, or have the ability to do so as long as I live. And so you pray that we'll be able to do this. And maybe tomorrow, beginning tomorrow, we may look at one of those books we've been working on because there's so many nuggets of truth that's revealed as you study. And so uh, now saying that, I want to get right into where we left off today. Actually, I want to go back to verse number 11. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. For what man, I've been meditating on this verse a little bit, just a little bit more than I had done before the services this morning. For what man knoweth the things of a man? Now, preacher, I may be incorrect on this, but not on purpose or not maliciously. It'll be just out of plumb ignorance. But it's saying, for what man knoweth the things of a man? And I think that can be on a personal level. In other words, how can a man know anything unless there's a spirit within him that gives him that capacity? Now, you know we are a triparty or three-part being, uh, not exactly like and just like God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but God works with trinities even in our humanity. We have a soul, we have a body, and we have a spirit. But I don't believe in this case it's referring to the spirit in a godly sense as having the capacity to recognize God. Now in your humanity, having a body, you have no recognition. With your body, uh, your body cannot recognize a thing. Did you know that? I guess it was, became so apparent to me although I knew it already, but when my uh, oldest boy died, Jamie, of a, fr a frontal brain aneurysm, <clears throat> I, can't, I, I, I can't even describe how shocking it was to me to see his still lifeless body laying before me and knowing that he had no cognizance, no recognition, no awareness that his daddy and his host of friends and family and mother was standing around him, or around his body. And it occurred to me like it never has before that Jamie, the person I really knew, was no longer there. 
That was a representative type of who Jamie was to give us recognition. And the purpose of a body is for our recognition, to recognize who we are. But when I look at you, I don't really see you. And when I go to a mirror, do you realize? When I go to a mirror I, and look at the mirror or even a photograph, I don't see myself. He said, well, who are you looking at? I'm looking at a reflection of who I am. You have had the opportunity to see me, but I haven't had the opportunity to see myself. Do you understand what I'm saying? But even if I had that capacity, do you know that the most, all it's doing, when I'm able to see you, I can look at you and I can say, oh, I know him. But I know you and to a certain degree. I'm not trying to be philosophical here, but I, this verse is important to me now in this regard. When I look at someone, uh, I see you and I, I have recognition by looking at you. That'd be no different than a tree has a body. You go out and look at a tree and you can say, well, that's a pecan tree. I call them pecan trees. It may be pecan to you, but uh, we grow to things, so give us that much benefit. <laughs> and then I look out there and I see a pine tree. And there's, there's something about that body, that tree, that gives me awareness of what it is. You even say a body of water. That's the if you were in, uh, in the area of Palestine and in the, and, 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 and the places where we study about and read about in the Bible, uh, you might see the, the Red Sea, a body of water. I remember going to the Dead Sea, a body of water. And uh, it had, I had the ability to recognize it. But when you're talking about the spirit of man, I believe in the way the text is rendered here, is talking about that which makes up your will, your intellect, and your emotions. I don't believe in this case. I think it's making a general description. That's when I said, please correct me if I'm not interpreting this right because I don't want to mislead anybody. But I believe it's saying that it's speaking of a man has an awareness because he has will, intellect, and emotions. Intellect, your capacity to learn. Uh, we say that, where does that originate? Uh, it originates in your brain or in your mind. And then poetically, you may say it like this, I love you with all my heart. But that biological pump inside the cavity of your chest is not doing any loving at all. It's too busy trying to keep you alive. <laughs> Amen? But that's the way we say things. Because we use those descriptive terms to say, I love you with all my heart. And your heart is a very, certainly a very part of your uh, being. But uh, your heart's not where all the thinking takes place. <laughs> Your heart is not where you have will and intellect and emotions. We've learned and studied that it comes from the brain area. In other words, within the brain, a person has a stroke, like we were talking about Sister Marty. Uh, she has a certain part of his, her brain impaired. And, uh, yeah, and that's because those functions that previously came so easy to her, for some reason, it's been blocked. No longer able to happen. Now when it's talking here, it says, well, what, knoweth, what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? So I believe, preacher, would it seem, seem correct that my spirit that's within me gives me my awareness? It gives me understanding not only about you, but what understanding I have about myself originates in my own brain. <laughs> I mean, that sounds kind of crude, but we know that's where it originates. Or can we say in your mind? That's the reason the Scriptures also says, let this, he don't say, it doesn't say let this brain be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, but it said let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. And that's a part of you that are to be conformed, Romans 12, 1 and 2, to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's saying here, 
For what man knoweth the things of a man uh, apart from the spirit of man which is in him? How can you know yourself even if there wasn't something alive within you? So, even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. So, if you do not have, now jump over to the spiritual part of your existence. You have a soul, I mean you have the spirit of your existence which is within you, soul, body, and spirit. You have the, um, <clears throat> and then you have the part of you that has to be quickened by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit quickens your dead spirit. And when he does that, you have life. But the natural unregenerate person cannot receive the things of God because that part of him is dead. Also described as being dead in your trespasses of sin. Now, he's t Paul is telling us this, I believe, for us to have a proper understanding. If you're not reborn, you're not converted or born again by the Spirit of God and having that part of you soul, body, and spirit. Your soul is your will, intellect, and emotions. It's mostly used to describe those things, but sometimes it's used to describe your spirit. But most of the time it's not. But you can determine that within the context of how it's used. But your spirit is a part that has to be quickened or made alive, and that gives us reason to understand where Christ, as Colossians teaches, Christ in you, the hope of glory. In other words, when God sees you, for you to, it's not just as if you had never sinned. When Christ Jesus lives within you, He does not see you just as if you had never sinned. He sees it on a more noble plane than that. He sees you through the person of His Son, Jesus Christ, as never having sinned. And that's... that's <laughs> Well, that is so worthy of our consideration. In other words, yes, you will fail. Yes, you are weak. Yes, you will think wrong about things. But one day, glory be unto God, you're going to have a glorified body. You're going to have a glorified mind. You're going to have the ability to think things you're incapable of now because you're going to have the perfect mind of Christ Jesus working within you at, your, at the glorification. And even certain aspects of... If found in Christ Jesus when it went was glorified. You remember his priestly prayer? I think you referred to it. Uh, the model prayer and the and the prayer of Jesus uh, in, in in 17th chapter wasn't that preacher that you referred to in Sunday school? Uh, the pre, the priestly high priestly prayer. <laughs> Those five verses speaks of him being glorified. He says, "Restore me back <laughs> to where I was." We're before the, the, even the beginning of the worlds. <laughs> In other words, he says, I want to be restored. And then if you study Philippians, you'll see seven steps when he became man in his humiliation, but in turn, in, process, in the process of him being restored, you see seven steps in his exaltation. <laughs> In other words, he said, I'll give you a name above every name. And that pictures the restoration. But here is talking about having a, the mental capacity to know things in your earthly existence. And then it's talking about having the capacity to know th the things of God. It's making a contrast here. Verse 11 is. And, the, and so with that being in mind, look at verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is God. Now, for that to be so, who is that speaking about? We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is God. Uh, the natural unregenerate man cannot receive the things of God, for it's what to him? That's right. He, that can only be spiritually discerning. They're foolishness unto him. And so he says, but we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words of which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, if you want a really good uh, a teacher, uh, listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying. 
in agreement with the Word of God. You know, one of the most rewarding times of study or listening to someone teaching the Word of God, even as it was in Sunday school, as I was, was speaking to you a while ago, it was when, when the Holy Spirit would bring to my remembrance some things that I had previously studied, and the Holy Spirit would connect those things to what He was saying. And I'm telling you, just sitting there, listening, at the same time the Lord feeding your spirit, that is such a rewarding time to spend with the Lord, whether it be in private devotion, or whether it be sitting in a Sunday school class, or coming to a church where someone's preaching the Word. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Can a few more of you just say amen? It just means so be it. That's the truth. Do you believe that's the truth? <laughs> amen. And so, but then, <clears throat> it says, We have not received the things of the Spirit of the world. Look at verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. And he's saying you need to learn the ways of God, not the ways of man. And there's two words compounded together that gives us that understanding. Our word knowledge comes from a word gnosis. But it's an interesting, I like doing word studies. <laughs> I like studying just old, 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 old King James Dictionary, if you know what I mean. Uh, but anyway, I also like studying some of the words just to give some intensity to it or some meaning to it, how it's used. And that word, uh, when you see the word knowledge, <laughs> Well, it's speaking of not learning the ways of the heathen. To learn the ways of a heathen, you've got to lean towards that which is heathen. But to learn the ways of God, or, and even a husband knows his wife, it takes two words, epic and gnosis. Gnosis for knowledge, epic simply means you lean towards the one you want to know more about. <laughs> Isn't that something? If I want to know more about God, I don't learn the ways of the heathen. If I want to know about God, I don't want to lean toward the world. And we're even told by in the epistle of John, it says, Love not the world, neither things that are in the world. For if any man by his own volition I will love if the world, the love of the Father is not in you. And the second verse down, the world passeth away and the lust say, ah, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So what should I know? I should know the will of God. How do I know the will of God? From the Word of God. I cannot know what His will is if I don't know what His Word is. And so therefore, and then the Holy Ghost can teach you, but the natural man what we've been quoting, verse 14, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Now we start in verse 11 talking about the Spirit of man and the Spirit of God. That's the reason if you only have your own spirit and your own ability to know things apart from God, you cannot discern those things. That's the reason I made a big uh, issue of it. Because in order to know the things of God... <laughs> You have to have spiritual discernment. And that's what he is saying here. But he that is, uh, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish in son to him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But what does verse 15 say? Say, but he that is spiritual judgeth how many things? All things, yet he himself is judge of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Now, isn't that an interesting question? Now, he has perfect mental capacities. He has omniscience, all knowledge. So, uh, in this, our humanity, we can know him, but we cannot know him completely. We can know as much as we need to know about him by this book, uh, the Word of God. But, we are given instructions, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. And I believe what that is saying, I believe that says, going back to what we've already said, our intensity, our intent, and our focus ought to be on learning, leaning towards Him and learning more about who He is. And the way you do it is this book. That's the only way. 
And so, for who hath known, verse 16, the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Now, there's three things. I want to, I mean, there's three areas of your existence I want you to consider. And we said there are three, uh, two major groups of people, saved and lost. But within the saved, they're spiritual and carnal. So I, beginning with this thought, are you a man who is saved by God? If you're saved, you've been delivered. You're not going to hell. Your sins are forgiven. A, a saved person has been delivered from the extreme wrath of God. And those who are saved are to wake up every day with a calm, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Was it Fanny Crosby you was talking about the bluegrass? Well, she wrote some other bluegrass songs too. I saw you turn around. Here's another one if you can play bluegrass and otherwise. You can play it even highbrow. And I've heard it both ways. If I hang around here long enough and listen to you, I'll probably hear it in the bluegrass. But, don't, but take heart. <laughs> Rufus Edmiston, a preacher that used to preach for us, he said, I don't know why you don't like bluegrass down here. He said, uh, that's the kind of grass we're going to have growing in heaven, bluegrass. <laughs> uh, he had a little bias there, I'm sure, because he sure loved it. And y'all would have gotten along real good. I, I get along, got along that way with him pretty good too. But here's Fanny Crosby's song. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation. Boy, couldn't she write. Purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Uh, this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. And then she goes on to say, perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions are in rapture, now burst in my sight. Angels descending, bring from above. Uh, echoes of mercy, uh, whispers of love. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, I'm happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, I hope it is. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Not only if you're saved, do you, have you been delivered, but as our text indicates, in several places already being brought to your attention, if you're saved, you have discernment. And it comes when you are spiritually minded. For one that is carnal minded, your discernment will absolutely be hindered. A natural mind will have no spiritual discernment. A carnal person at times may appear to have no discernment. If you don't know what the Word of God says, and you're carnal, and you're still feeding on the milk, then you won't have any discernment in certain areas of your existence in your life. So number one, uh, the first major question, are you a man who has been saved by God? And if you're saved, or if you are saved, are you a person who is straying from God? Straying from God. In 1 Corinthians 3, 1, it says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as to babes in Christ. He said, I fed you with the milk, and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For, uh, for a while one said, one said, I am a Paul, and another I am a Paulus. Are ye not carnal? And so we see by that <laughs> that... <laughs> A person can be carnal or fleshly and straying from God. And here's the displeasure on the part of God when you are being carnal. If we are carnal, God cannot and will not find pleasure in us. The Lord says, Why call ye me Lord and not do the things that I say? In verse Romans 8, 7, Because the carnal Mind is what? 
enmity against God. For it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. If so, then they that are in the flesh, you know what it says? They cannot please God. It is God's will that we be Christ-minded, not carnal-minded. To be carnal-minded is fleshy. And that kind of carnality, God hates. And you know, before man's conversion, there's an enmity between God and man. And I believe it's uh, Colossians 1.11 says that, there ha that to have peace with God, that peace comes from the shedding of the blood of the cross. And without the shedding of the blood of the cross, there can be no reconciliation. There can be no peace with God. If you have not accepted and had applied the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the only way that you can be accepted by God. Now, when you think of the magnitude of that, it ought to cause you to marvel. In Romans, in chapter 5, Paul describes the, how sin entered into uh, humanity, the human family, the hum humanity. By one man, sin entered into the world. And it was that death that came by that sin. And that's the reason we experienced uh, the curse of death and dying and disease because of one man's sin that was transferred by him to us and beyond. And so, but then it says also by another man, the man Christ Jesus, we can have the forgiveness of sin and we can be reconciled. And the word reconcile, a basic meaning of that is to become friends again. Not having that enmity. That enmity will be destroyed. But then there's a death that comes from carnality. And this morning I said for a believer that carnality does not bring you the ultimate death, separation from God. And this is where several years ago I was listening to a message by Dr. Seitler and he was talking about reading in verse number uh, Romans 8, 5, it said, For they that are after the flesh do not do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Verse 6, For to be carnally minded is what? Death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now when he made that statement, he made, gave some examples. And I, and I begin to meditate and think on that. And I begin to expound personally on that. And I wrote down eight things that I just want to share with you briefly that happens in, in, when you're carnal, the kind of death it brings. And you know, I think of that word death, and it's a strong word. When you think of someone dying, or maybe in a tragic accident, when you think about the cessation of life, that that life of that person ends right there on the spot. It may be someone dear and precious to you that you would have liked to get, had just one more minute otherwise to have spent with that person to make final preparations. But you didn't have it. So in that sense, death can be very startling. Now he speaks of another kind that we can enjoy. And that's the death of the saint that we can envision, and that we can look forward to. And praise God, we can have that blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, oh what a foretaste of glory divine. In other words, it's real, it's not imaginary. And one of the things that keeps this old codger still kicking and getting up every morning as I'm able is just by virtue of knowing that I'm still in the race. I'm still doing the work that God's called me to do. And what a thrill it is as a 70, nearly a three quarters of a century old, God lets me get up. I'm a 74 year old man this past week. And just knowing that I'm getting up every day. And by the way, I'm celebrating a lot of ways. My wife and I celebrated 52 years of marriage. That ain't bad either. In addition to that, I'm celebrating this month 50 years being ordained as a Baptist preacher. You just don't know how thrilling it is to my soul. I don't know what that means to you upon hearing it other than you're just an old man.
but it's thrilling to me to know that God has allowed me to continue to serve him in this capacity for all these years. You just don't know how thrilling that is. You don't know how stirring it is to wake up every day to know that I have purpose, to know that i got a reason for getting up again. And I can't think of anything that would be more boring to think or to have to hear, you did run well, but what doth now hinder thee? You know, that, that ought to be startling also. I know the time will come when some of my physical activity will cease and my mental, mental cognizance could very well cease, get to the place where I cannot even think a, a sentence through. But in the meantime, I want to take every opportunity I can to use, kind of looking at the sand in a sand glass, hourglass, it's almost the way it feels now, and see that sand trickling through, talking about how fast time is passing. Life is just a vapor, appear for a little time, then vanish away. For what is your life? It's even a vapor. And then that sand is just trickling through, and you look over at the sand glass, representing your life as a metaphor of your living. You're a sand glass. Your time's about up. When I think of that, I think of, well, I better, I better as Dr. Sautler used to say, redeem the time. And then he had to explain it. He says that means to seize up the time remaining. I'm looking at people who's been blessed to be around a while. Some of you are more youthful. But there's still people right here Maybe God's wanting you to turn it up about three notches. I think one of the worst things would be uh, for us to quit too soon on God. In other words, if you can't do what you used to do by way of physical limitation, say, dear God, what can I do otherwise? And not use that as an excuse to say, well, we'll let some of these younger folks do it. Uh, you know, you wouldn't be enjoying Kentucky Fried Chicken <laughs> if uh, Colonel Sanders said, well, I'm 65 or so years old. I'm too old to fry any more chicken. <laughs> now, that ought to be encouraging to anyone that has a preacher's heart <laughs> just to knowing that there's a way that you can go out there on the spur of the moment and get chicken, fried chicken. <laughs> you said today about... Uh, a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, a preachers, uh, um, Billy Kelly, Billy Kelly, uh, uh, big old Billy Kelly, <laughs> behind this leather belt. Oh, say it, preacher. A chicken graveyard. <laughs> and I remember, I think I remember him saying it. But anyway, it says for the, they that mind are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. What does that mean? You can get so preoccupied with fleshly things that you don't do spiritual things. And to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And, um, and that I believe, preacher, that's where I believe God will have me to stop tonight. But tomorrow... I want to show you some definite things. I want us to think how carnality bringeth forth death. Bringeth forth death. Death of what? Well, here's just one of them to think about. So you know what kind of how I'm thinking. The death of your witness or testimony. I, I, I use the verse, you did run well, but what doth now hinder thee? In the score of my 50 years serving God as an ordained Baptist preacher, I've seen so many along the wayside that's allowed something to come into their life to take and rob them of the opportunity of continually serving God. It might be something of the magnitude that it absolutely destroyed their testimony. And try as they may, there's some things that are not cardinal in the sense that there's no forgiveness because I believe in a, a God that forgives but I believe there are sins that's disqualifying. I believe the Bible teaches that. And for that reason, I believe people, uh, they had to witness the personal death of their uh, witness or testimony at some capacity. 
Now, if they got things right with God, they may come back, but most of them will tell you, just like in the Old Testament example, I come back and I can no longer fight with a strong right hand. I have to fight with a left hand, which pictures a level of weakness. But aren't you glad, even with that being said, even with wicked Samson, how be it his hair began to grow again. God is a God that gives us other opportunities if we come to Him. He's a merciful God. You read that in Sunday school. I believe your passage of Scripture. I heard it over and over again. For His mercy endureth forever. For His mercy endureth forever. For His mercy. Did you get that? His mercy endureth. Aren't you glad of that? So if you fail to falter along the way, then draw a line, step over it, and say, Dear God, if you'll take me just as I am, I want to see my testimony, my life resurrected so that I can go on for thee. I think you see there the area I'm going into as we look at it again tomorrow. Father, thank you, Lord, so much for this blessed opportunity to meet with these dear people. And thank you for the opportunity to open the blessed book, the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, for these eternal truths that are there to prop us, to stabilize us, to help us, uh, to encourage us, to comfort us, and all the many uh, descriptives that we could use that tells us how wonderful uh, the salvation of the Lord is and all that, it, that, uh, that accompanies that salvation. And Father, if there's a person here that's had the will of God, they're not where they need to be. Or they've allowed themselves to drift. I pray that Holy Ghost conviction will come upon them. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.